Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com, uh, here to do another Fate's Warning uh, album, or related album review, and then I got my vinyl I talked about yesterday, so I'll do another separate video, I think, for that. But um, So, well, I left off yesterday with uh, 2004's FWX, and so what happened was, of course, after that album, you know, OSI had happened previously, and... Arch, or John Arch's EP, um, Twist of Fate, um, had come out in 2003, so I mean that was, but then Jim ended up working with Kevin Moore on the next OSI album, I don't know if they did any touring, they probably did, um, I know that some of the remasters also were about to come out in that time frame, but the OSI, second OSI album, uh, Free, which I talked about a little bit of, like last year when I got, I got the first OSI album uh, on vinyl, and I don't know, I could go for buying a physical copy, but, you know, I know they issued it on vinyl. So that came out in 2006, in 2007, 2008. I know some of those, like, remasters came out, including some of the art stuff, the uh, Spectre Within and Awaken uh, the Guardian, um, probably even Night and Brocken, um, and some of the, the earlier Ray Alder albums um, between 2000, like, 2008, 2009, 2010. And I saw Fate's Warning again. I'd seen them in 2001, that show. But I saw them again live at uh, the Prague Power USA Festival um, in, in, in Atlanta. Uh, headline. That was, I mean, to this day, that's really, I consider the first full show. They did, I think, the I Ever Get to Dream in full at that show. Um, and it was with Bobby Jars on back. I didn't mention that Fate's Warning's drummer, like the last album FWX had been, Mark Zonder's final album with them. That also, they had actually toured with Dream Theory and Queens record before that, but I know, like, just before that, but I know that Zonder, like, left the band. He didn't even go on that whole tour. Um, but he was on other things. There was some talk he was going to work with Gary Workamp. Uh, it was a project that was going to be called Alpha Dog, but it didn't happen. Then later he did Slave Ear. But I don't think that was with Workamp. But, um, so, yeah, and Fate's Warning was just on hold other than these remasters that came out, and they played maybe one or two reunions in those, you know. And so, and then, well, because Jim's work with um, OSI, and then 2009, I believe, was Blood. So that was the same year that they played Prague Party USA. I know they had Michael Ackerfeld on one song, guest radio log, I think it was. I think it was. Anyway, um, so... Again, Fate's Warning's not really active. Um, you know, Ray Alder's with Redemption, you know, uh, other than the few live shows they did, um, in that whole window of time. So, but because of the the success or good experience that John Arch specifically had making that EP uh, back in 2002, 2003, whenever it came out, he, t he decided to get together and they talked to Brian Slagle from Metal Blade and they signed a it was a contract for, I guess, two albums, but um, and their debut album came out in 2011. So 2010 is probably when they, when Jim, they recorded it, probably wrote and recorded, or maybe early 2011. I don't know if I have that information on. But this album, the debut album from Arch Matheos, which they only have two albums. I'll be talking about the other one in a later video soon. Uh, came out September 9th, 2011. So its 10 year anniversary actually is going to be in a few weeks. Um, yeah, it was like two days before the the 9-11 the 10-year uh, whatever anniversary or comm commemoration. Oh, interesting. My CD's not even in here. I think my CD might have been... I don't know. And then I, I got this sign, too, which is interesting. Um, and this is like... 2011 was a pretty big turning point, like transition point for me. Job, met my girlfriend at that point. A lot of things were changing, you know, just for me... And so I think of 2011, the end of the decade, beginning of the next decade, per se. Oh, and I should pull that up if I have it. I think I do. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, and let me show the vinyl here in a minute. I have the vinyl for this. If I can... This is an album that um, I, I could not have been... Well, it's weird. I was just thinking, I revisited it again today. At the time this album came out, here I'll show the vinyl here, and then I'll show I can show the artwork you know, again. I got the I got the one signed there, but um, the time you know my tastes 
in prog metal, not that I didn't like it, but this was a prog, I mean, it's face warning members and the lineup, I, I should go over quickly. See the, the pages and the artwork, it's very dense. Um, is it cliche? I don't know if I'd call it cliche exactly, but um, from an artwork standpoint or sort of the tone and vibe and image and stuff like that. All right, so it's only got six songs. There is a Frank is Frank Arresti plays some souls. I know because it's I have to see John Arch and Jim Matheos. Jim did some of the mixing too, but you know Frank Arresti was showed up on played a few solos. Um, Bobby Jarzon Beck was the drummer, and he had been the drummer of Fates, where he, he played at that show at the Prague Par USA Festival in 2009, too. I remember that festival specifically for a couple other reasons. They had Orphan Land, who had seen it a second time, but the other reason was I was hoping to see Andre Matos after he had previously been tried to be booked, and it still didn't happen. Visa, so I never got to see him. But he was booked, and then they had to cancel his band, his solo band. But, uh, but anyway, and Joey Vera, um, Again, it was the bass player. So, I mean, the thing is, you look at this lineup, it basically is Fate's Warning minus Ray and Add John. So that's why people were confused why they didn't just call it Fate's Warning, but the, the truth is, yeah, I don't know. Um, so here, okay, so I got the vinyl. There's something about the vinyl that I'll, I'll briefly tell. You know, the top of my vinyl is a little mark there. I'm a little, but that happens. I'm learning over time, you know, a little bit wear and tear, just slight wear and tear. Um... So, I mean, you think about this, the, the previous, he'd been doing OSI, Jim Matheos, you know, J John obviously was coming off that EP for many years before. Um, thick pressing, of course. Um, just black. And they fit, managed to get it in one, because, I mean, while it is only six songs, every track, other than, like, one, the shortest track is in Sense and Mir, Mir, Mir the last track at 522. Midnight Serenade's 527, but, um... Neurotically Wired is 11 minutes and 12 seconds. On the Fence is 8, 11, 8 minutes and 11 seconds. Um, Stained Glass Sky, 1356. That's the longest piece. Any Given Day, 1027. Um, yeah, here, I think so you get the lyrics on the jacket and everything, too. Where my compact disc is, I think it's, you know what, it's probably in that book. I, if I had to guess, you know, the thing is, in 2011, yeah, that was still the point where I was bringing my um cds to work but you know it wasn't that long after basically when i started using a laptop i was more burning cds i don't know if it's in here so it's gonna have to remain um in a place i don't know until i'll probably find it some later time it's probably in a jewel case of another that's what i often would do and that's why a lot of my cds are, are you know misplaced um anyway so all right so this album is very, I'd call it dense. It's very guitar driven. And I remember when I got it, I was like totally excited to get it because how much I loved, I loved John Arch. I loved, you know, of course, the, the A Twist of ADP so much. I'd been playing that thing to death. I just, you know, it was frequently a go-to. Um, but I was just thinking my taste in music at the time in 2011, 2010, 2009, was not so much about prog metal. I was into more of getting exploring like the technical metal and extreme metal, which some of that is prog metal. A lot of it's prog metal in a lot of ways. Um, but traditional sounding prog metal, I guess you could put it in, again, sort of for lack of a better way to put it, wasn't something I was listening to nearly at the same amount that I had had, I had at least uh, definitely 10 years before, you know, around the time of the previous Fate's Warning albums. I was listening, I was all into... Not much the Mars Volta, but Dredge and Ours and, you know, the bands I've basically lived on the last decade and change, especially. And, you know, the Deer Hunter, especially. And um, looking at where this finished in 2011 on my Albums of the Year list or where it finished or where it is right now, because this is an update list. You know, and I, I would not put the Deer Hunter's color spectrum number one anymore. I would probably bump Hotel the Laughing Tree back up. I don't know. Yeah, and you have Kimbra's Vows, and you have Mute Mass Odd, Odd Soul. Mute Mass Odd Soul might, if I need to rethink this. I love the color spectrum, but um, the Beach Boys, the Smile Sessions. And I, okay, so I did bump it down. Because I know that year when I was doing Albums of the Year and everything in my blog, in the All Meter Reviews blog, um, 
it was number four, five, like five or six. It was, I mean, it came out late in the year, obviously, but um, I have it at number ten. Battle Circus is a title, self-titled album. Each of the Wall, The Apologist. That that I mean, talking about prog metal of sorts. That's an extreme prog metal album, post metal. Uh, Team Me to the Tree t- Treetops. Three, the Ghost You Gave to Me. Yeah, all right. So then I can understand that, but um, I haven't listened to it that much. Is the uh, the brutally honest truth? As much as again, like on paper for what this was going to this was, uh, you know, Jim Matheos working again with John Arch doing. Very proggy, very guitar-driven uh, and mixed and emphasized. But the thing is, I would say 80% of the music on here is very much your sort of punchy riff, you know, me- metal riff guitars. Um, a lot of it is technical, but it's mixed. The mixing, even with Arch's vocals, the guitar really does... Arch's vocals take a little bit of a back seat, even though they're there. And even when Arch's vocals are there... You compare it to the stuff he had done with Fate's Warning originally, and even the, and of course the Twisted Fate EP. They're, they're, it's not, they're not as memorable. They're memorable at points, but, um, but I'll say that Incense and Myrrh, I love that last track. Stained Glass Sky is definitely a song I enjoy. I enjoy more like I look, look forward to certain parts, little riffs, little like segues, little dynamic parts. Um, some of the lyrics. Um, does it have the lyrics on the back here? Yeah, I mean, Insurrection, Resurrection. I think that's on Any Given Day. Because um, John Arch, like Johnny Anderson, it's, he, in interviews he was talked about this. You know, he's the vocal lines, he's singing, and the, especially the lyrics he's writing. Sometimes it's one or the other, but he's writing more of how they sound as opposed to what they read like from a literal sense. Um, even if it's like poetry. It was the same thing with the early Fates Warning, although you listen to A Twist of Fate... To a twist of fate, the lyrics really, they really kind of work so well with the music and from a, so, you know, from a from a literal standpoint, they work, I think, better at least. Uh, Midnight Serenade is nice. It, again, that's, it's that's sort of a bad, not a ballad, but it for what, you know, there's there's not a lot of like breathing room on a lot of this album, and so, I mean, I get it. I get why people, a lot of people love it because it's really almost the most technical album up to this point that Jim Matheos had ever done. I think I'd pretty much say so, because I think a lot of ways it was more technical than even um, some of the stuff on Disconnected, and I would compare it in some ways to, like, No Exit. It's like modern-sounding No Exit with modern production in some ways if John Arch were singing. That's that's only half accurate, I guess, but that is one way to describe it, in that it... No Exit is so much emphasized in so those punchy, thick, thrashy guitar riffs. Um, but I'll say that I think Ray's vocals on No Exit have more... It's, they're mixed higher, and so you, you get a little more from them, but from a like a sort of understandability, you know, here, you know, legibility, legibility, what's the word? Understandability? Basically, to make out what he's actually saying, it's almost about a push. Um... But, uh, you know, it's just weird. It's I knew this from when I heard it, and I was just kind of kidding myself. The fanboy in me was like, no, I love this album. It's really good. People need to hear it. But at the same time, I'm like, I didn't go back to it nearly as often as I probably assumed I would have. But at the same time, I still enjoyed it when I did. I enjoyed parts of it. That's kind of... it was. It's kind of like Between the Barrier Me, and that in 2011 was like maybe like the peak of my interest because since then, my, between, my interest in Between the Barrier to Me has waned. I still don't mind them, but um, it's so it's it's you know I mean I I yeah like I'll even say I think it's any given day yeah this points reminds me of a little bit of Dream Theater like you know and maybe that's a Rusty and Rusty's solo like, soloing maybe you know how many years since he had been recording with them kind of listen to a little bit of Dream Theater it's like oh that's a little John Petrucci part on the fence I mean. The first track, Neurotically Wired, works well as an opener, I guess, for the most part. But, I mean, it's just, this is very, very guitar riffy. Um, and even with John Arch's vocals, while I appreciate them, I think Incense and Myrrh is, like, the one track that reminds me a lot of what they what he, what they pulled off with Twisted Fate, with where the, the climbing part and the kind of, you know, it's like a, it's really a, not a, not a, um crescendo it's sort of a crescendo and it ends the record well so 
I guess I'd say that this album is good, but it's it's maybe not as good as on paper as it came out. I guess that's the best way to put it. But you know, I, I'll I'll just when I do the ranking soon, once I'm finished with this, you'll see where it, it ends up. It's a, it's I guess you could say it's become sort of a frustrating record that I've kind of just you know it's there, it's fine. I wouldn't mind hearing it, but at the same time, if I'm going to listen to it, I need to kind of have the mindset that this is going to be very dr- guitar-driven. It almost could be just like a, uh, like a Jim Matteo solo album in some ways. I do like Job- Bobby Johnson Beck's performance in this. I think he does what Zonder did, but he brings a little more to the table. But um, anyway, so what's your take on Sympathetic Resonance from um, Arch Matteo's, which, you know, like I said, is basically... It's Face Warning under a different name with a different singer, with their previous singer. But, um, you know, it would have been interesting to see what, what, how Ray would have sounded with this. Although, some of it is just the writing. And I think this is what Jim was going for from a writing standpoint. Maybe he wanted it to be a little different than OSI. Which, you know, OSI, the more it went along, seemed to be driven by Kevin Moore's sort of atmospheric patches. And, you know, the guitars were more like sort of... They were more textures as opposed to riffs not as i mean there was some but not as much now i think the one that followed this fire make thunder that they came out after this album was more guitar oriented um and i think that's kind of maybe what jim thought he after some of the records they put out in the 2090s and the 2000s he wanted to get back to more dry because this reminds me of in some ways of the 80s fates warning with sounding kind of with a mod with modern production in some ways because 80s Fates Warning, the early stuff is very guitar guitar oriented, guitar driven. Uh, the guitars really just, you know, are the are almost the first the front of the the sound. I mean, it's almost 50 50 in some ways with the, but this album, I think it's like 60 40, 70 30, maybe even 80 20. It's maybe not 80 20, but it's even just when he's when Arch is singing, some of the guitars are mixed so high that it, it's like the the vocals are like a rhythm part in some ways, because you know, of course you're you know, reading through the lyrics or trying to, you know, understand the lyrics, you know, um, you know, close your eyes or dream your life away. Oh, that's, that's from Midnight Serenade. I mean, paint, Stained Glass Sky is maybe the the best sort of, you know, uh, yeah, Oresti has a soul on that song, but as far as like prog metal epics on this, Master They Shall for th- for the many, uh, Martyr, they, they endear thee, Father is... It was written, so it shall be. Mother yields the pure seed. Child, uh, it's your your destiny. Your destiny, so hallowed by thy name. I know, like Jack B. Nimble, Jack B. Quick is mentioned in one of these songs. I mean, that's the thing is, it's not as memorable. Maybe that's probably the biggest thing from this record is that almost every Fate's Warning record, and including the, the RGP up to this point, there was definitely a lot of memorable parts. And this album, this album. A few of those, like that insur- re- insurrection, resurrection, the vocal lines aren't as memorable. At least I've listened as many times I've listened to it. Even the, a lot of the guitar parts aren't as memorable, and I don't think that's what they're going for. They weren't going for anything catchy or poppy. That this is probably the least poppy album Jim Matheos had ever recorded. Um, but you know, if, if that's what they were going for, that totally pulled it off. It's just it became. I guess I see it now, and it became, and I see it now probably as much as a mood record as anything else. But anyway, again, what's your take on Sympathetic Resonance? Do you th- do you love it? Do you think it's, you know, kind of one that's not, not, it's not been worth your time? Or do you think it's, you know, as good of a thing in, that the Face Warning Canon's ever made, you know? Love to hear about it. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and we'll see you next time.